Everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience Live. It's February twenty fourth, two thousand thirteen. Wow, it seems. Does it seem weird to you that it's two thousand thirteen? In not it, I mean, particularly, it's got to be something. I, yeah, I try not to put any emphasis on dates. Maybe it's maybe I'm just feeling old. I do remember for a lot of years thinking how cool it was going to be when we rolled over, and then that wasn't particularly cool. Yeah, so it's like another year. And then you know when the when the Y two K stuff, it's like wait till twenty ten. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. pretty much just another year, and another year. I'm Matt Dillahunty, this is Jeff D. We are back on the Atheist Experience, a live call-in show out of Austin, Texas. Uh, there's, uh, I, I, I've already completely forgotten what it is that I shouldn't, shouldn't talk about. How are you? Fine. You? I don't know. <laughs> not, not as good as I previously suspected. <laughs> anyway, as I mentioned, we're a live show out of Austin, Texas. You can find out more information at the website, www.atheist-community.org. And after today's show is together, why we can't tell you what to do, but some of us will be going to eat at Threadgill's 301 West Riverside Drive, and they'll have the address up there for you shortly. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to go over before we started I, diving in? I do not. I'm here to talk to callers. Let's dive. David in Ridgewood, how are you? I'm doing very well. Um, I'm glad I got everything. Uh, can you guys hear me? We can. Hi, David. Okay. Uh, I, I'll tell you first, I, I am a Christian, but I do like to read the, the arguments from atheists. And, um, you know, I certainly like to read, um, you know, Christopher Hitchens and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a couple questions for you guys. Okay. Uh, first of all, have you guys like have you guys made up your mind that there's no God, or are, are you still open to that possibility? Well, I guess it depends on the definition of God, but by and large, um, I, ha I would not assert that there are absolutely no gods under all conditions and stuff. I think there are, think there are some gods that are, you know, we can exclude because they're logically contradictory or contradictory with reality. But uh, I'm open. I'm a skeptic, so I'm open to being uh, believing anything provided there's evidence for it. Okay, but so, so you'd still be open to the idea that, that the universe was created by a god, a deity, whatever that means, I guess. Right? Yeah, it depends on what that means. Yeah, <laughs> depending on how grumpy I am at that particular moment, I might <laughs> say, you know, to anybody trying to convince me of a god, you know, shut the F up and leave me alone. I've heard it a million times and not yet been convinced. But, you know, with, uh, when push comes to shove, yeah, okay, fine. So, um, uh, the, the possibility remains as slim as it may look based <laughs> on decades of hearing arguments and none of them holding any water. Yeah, there's a, there's a small problem, and, and I'll stop after this so you can get to whatever you want to say, but there's, there's a problem that I discussed on last week's show and again at the North Texas Student Conference where there's a difference between a phenomenon and the cause for the phenomenon. So I don't know how you could possibly demonstrate rationally a supernatural cause for some observed phenomenon. And I don't know how you could actually demonstrate that, which is why the people who are claiming um, to have evidence for the existence of God, it, it all seems to uh, come up short. And it may forever be stuck coming up short. Okay, that makes sense. Um, my next question is, as far as what bothers you, you guys about religion or, or about religious people, like, it, but I kind of want to elaborate on what I'm saying. It, is it religious faith that bothers you, or is it just r religious intolerance? Like, for example, um, like I, I understand why, like Christians criticizing gays or telling people that they're going to go to hell. Like, it, it, it's that that bothers. Like, like I, I would understand that bothering you. But it, like the fact that some people have faith and they go to church, does, does that bother you guys? Or yes, what bothers <laughs> me? Uh, what troubles me the most about religion is just the um, noise that it injects into every other aspect of life, right? And that, that noise is coming from people who have faith in things that they can't actually prove, and yet their faith leads them to believe that they are justified in believing that stuff, and 
you know, if once they think that their that their beliefs are justified, they're going to talk about it and think it's important and think it's worth sharing and so on. And and the result is a bunch of stuff that there's no good reason to b believe gets promoted in our culture, and this this affects all kinds of things. It get, interferes with education, it interferes with science, it interferes uh, socially. You know, I mean that the, the um, uh, religious intolerance is only one part of it. Yeah, I, I, I object for both the reasons that Jeff just listed and what you said, you know, would be the obvious reasons, but I object to it at a foundational level because, um, because of the things that it ends up doing. So this is, this is to me uh, why I said I object to people believing things on faith. If you have good reason to believe something, you don't need faith. And faith is not a path, uh, a, a reliable path to truth or correct understanding. Faith is indistinguishable from gullibility. You could believe anything on faith, and so we need some way to distill whether or not our beliefs are true, and that's why I object to faith. Well, you know, that, that all sounds like it made sense, but I mean, it, like, uh, I'm sure you know plenty of people that, uh, you know, they, they, they don't go out judging people, and, you know, they, they believe in God, and they kind of keep it private. I mean, it, it, do you think there's something wrong with that, or, like, um, I mean, I think they're, I think they're better. Uh, well, I don't, see, that's the thing. It, it, I mean... That's just a matter of degree. I mean, is is one gram of well, I don't I don't know my poisons, but some tiny <laughs> amount of poison that's not enough to kill you or even necessarily you know harm you. Does that make it okay? Well, no, really, it's a bad if it's a, if it's a unsafe thing. You probably want to stay away from it. Um, and, like and so that and so we so. we wind up playing this game where. Oh, sufficiently, su su sufficiently non-pushy, sufficiently private religion. Oh, that's that's supposed to be okay. Well, if the, if the basic approach to knowledge, represented by taking things on faith, is a bad idea. Then, um, yeah, there are instances of, of of people that do that and take it to the point where it's overtly harmful, and there's people who don't. But it's still a bad idea. You get what I'm saying? Mm. Okay. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to, um, I know that a, a lot of the reasons why I believe, I, and I, I have had good conversations with people that are into science and who, who don't believe in God, but they, I know that they would say that it was an argument from ignorance, but I, I don't know how to phrase this question, but um, it, is it at least, does it sound compelling, like the, like the argument that, like, Taking evolution as a fact, saying that like we started out as single-celled organisms and we evolved and evolved into so many things, you know, fish and then dinosaurs and then even to humans with these complex brains. Like, what do you think of the argument? Like, what are the chances that that happened on its own? Like, like, I mean, does this? If we were able to go back in time and look at the the single-celled organisms, you know, like what, what would have been the likelihood that they would have evolved into all those things without a designer? What would have been the likelihood that we would have ended up these people with these complex brains? You yeah, know what I mean? The interesting thing is that while we don't know everything about that, um, at least we can begin to calculate naturalistic explanations. I don't know how you came to the conclusion exactly. How did how do you calculate the probability that a god was involved? And, and then how do you determine that that's more probable than naturalistic causes? I mean, it's one of those things where if you're going to determine the probability of something, you need to know the number of times this has occurred in order to figure out your numinator and denominator. And in the case of God, we have zeros, mm -hmm. which either results in zero or a big fat error. So, I mean, I don't know how anybody could calculate that probability, but no matter how unlikely it is, for example, if you take a, a, a deck of 52 cards, and you shuffle it up and you deal out four hands of 13 like you were, you were dealing bridge, the odds that you would get 13 spades is exactly the same as the odds that you would get 13 cards that you would look at and say are a complete junk crap hand. You see, it's, I, I don't know off the top of my head, it's a, a, right, a billion. Right, and you something. get the same thing again, right? The okay, only yeah. reason that the 13 spades appear to have significance is because we imbue it with significance. We care about getting this good hand, and the same thing goes for the universe. The only reason we look around and say, wow, this is remarkable and it seems all made for me is because we have this big fat bias of we like to live, and so that we evolved to, to fit a universe and are then reflecting upon it and saying, hey, that's neat. Um, is very different from saying, oh, the universe was designed for me, something for which we have absolutely no evidence, or no good evidence, I guess, uh, since there are people who would, who would claim that uh, anecdotal revealed evidence exists.
Okay, that, 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 that sounds like it makes sense. Um, my last thing, and I, I know you probably have other calls, like, it seems like, I, do you think that re religions should be able to, like, change their argument? Like, for example, you know how, obviously, as science goes on, they change, like, maybe at one time they thought Pluto was a planet, but now they, they think that it's not, you know, or, and, you know, as time goes on, I'm sure if we were to talk to a scientist, you know, 50, 100 years ago, you know, the beliefs have changed. Like, I, it seems like religion, like, I kind of get the picture that atheists always point to the Bible and, and, and they say, you know, you know, that, you know, obviously there are plenty of flaws in the Bible and things that, you know, I, I don't believe in. Like, but at the same time, whenever religion tries to change the argument, they point and they say, oh, you know, it, it's like they're still holding us to the Bible. Like, can't, can't religious people change their arguments as, well, as we, yeah. okay, so the yeah. Bible was written by people thousands of years ago. They, they probably didn't even know what a germ was. And, you know and, what I mean? Like, it, yeah, but religion have the same ability to change their argument as time goes on. Hey, uh, yeah, but David, those yeah. people two thousand years ago were relying on what as their source of knowledge? Well, faith and claims of revelation. And people nowadays, uh, religious people nowadays, are relying on what for their information? Faith and claims of uh, of uh, divine revelation. So, you know, if it. With science, science can honestly change over time because science is a process where actual evidence and our actual capability of collecting evidence and analyzing evidence changes and improves and expands over time. There's nothing in revelation and faith that, that justifies, oh, well, you know, we, both people were using faith and faith is perfectly okay now, but we can just... We, we, we're not responsible for what people doing the exact same thing we're doing now came up with 2,000 years ago. You know, how come they couldn't, with their faith and claims of revelation, come up with the correct answer then? Yeah, you've got to. What's have, the excuse? You've, you've got to have some mechanism. Uh, you need some good reason to change. It's kind of it's kind of funny because we were talking right before the show. For example, you raised uh, a Pluto. They once it's not that they once thought it was a planet and they discovered it's not. What what Pluto is a, a strange case. No, we still know what Pluto is. Whether or not we label it as a planet is something completely different. But you want to talk about big changes? Um, before the show, we were talking about a competing theory to the to the current Big Bang model. Now uh, I'm no expert at all, but if the Big Bang model turns out to be incorrect in this competing theory or some other competing theory turns out to be correct, the change will come because of evidence, because we have learned more and because we can point to things to show why what we thought was correct before is not correct or not as correct. But by the way, we do know enough that while the model may be whatever we discover to actually be true or the next version of what we best how we best describe reality um, may be very, very different, it still has to explain all the same facts that this other model actually explains. It's not like we chuck away facts in order to appeal to a new model. Whereas when religions change, they already know what their goal is. And so they make attempts to interpret the evidence to fit the goal. The goal is always, let me demonstrate God exists, which is why you have these classical arguments for the existence of God, uh, the cosmological, you know, Kalam, uh, Right, they're starting at the end and trying to fit it in, right? Yeah, and they, they fall out of favor for a little while because they've been debunked, and then they get kind of reformed and redredged up, and it's because people are interested in leading the evidence where they want it to go instead of following the evidence where it leads, and that's the difference between religion and science. You show me a good reason if, if religious, a religious organization uh, changes their views for good reasons, I'm all for that. Hell, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in favor of them changing them to better views, even for bad reasons, if for no other th reason than it makes things better. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like it makes sense. I mean, I, you know, I, the last thing I want to say is, like, I, it seems like, especially on the Internet, that there's this animosity between the, you know, atheists and religious people, it, it, it doesn't really seem like, I, I don't think that that needs to be, I mean, I, I, I do believe in God, but I don't dislike atheists as people, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't dislike, for example, Christians, but I, I completely despise Christianity. It is, it is an, a, a moral, morally atrocious uh, religion when you really get down to it, this idea of original sin and substitutionary atonement and sacrifices and belief on faith and salvation from what to what by grace, it doesn't matter. It's, I mean, it's, 
We're stuck here on this planet with a brain, and we have what we know to be good tools to understand reality, the critical examination of evidence, the scientific process, the application of reason. Why would we ever stop using those unless somebody showed a better way? And so far, people haven't showed that faith is a better way. Every Every bit of evidence we get when people appeal to faith shows that it's a worse way, that it's less reliable. Oh, did we lose David? Sounds like we did. All right. Well, thanks for calling. That's too bad. I was going to ask him what, you know, it, just saying you're, you're religious or Christian really tells us almost nothing about what his actual beliefs are. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, I don't know what where David was coming from, but it is not at all uncommon to encounter... Christians who will say, oh, I don't dislike atheists, and yet they adhere to some of the most horrific beliefs yeah. about what ought to occur to atheists after we die, you know, which is one, my, there, my favorite little hobby horse. There so, are also a number of moderate be, and liberal believers, though, that there by are. And large, we don't have, like the Reverend Jerry, uh, Barry Lynn. Right. Supports church state separation, has some belief in God. I don't even know what his God beliefs really are because he doesn't put them out there. Right. Right. Um, and by and large, I think he is primarily a force for good, and I like him, uh, but I don't think it, the source of his force for good is his religious belief. I think it's his reason and, and intellect. Mm. But, yeah, I don't, I don't hate... I mean, how could you possibly hate all of any... I mean, well, I'm, I suppose if it was the right group, like uh, hate all racists type thing. But for a broad group that can, can have widely different beliefs, that beliefs, there's thousands of denominations of Christianity that disagree on everything. Yeah. So, yeah, not, uh, not an enemy of all Christians. I, I guess my point is that, you know, for Christians who are watching the show and who believe that they don't have a problem with atheists, uh, in some cases, a careful examination of your own beliefs will lead to the revelation that, in fact, you do have a big problem with atheists. You're just told that, you know, this is kind and loving. Yes. We have to deal with that. It reminds bit. me of the, the, I'm not a racist, but. Sure. Yeah. I don't hate Christian. I don't hate atheists, but I think you guys deserve to go to hell. What? What, 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 what was that? Don't, I, don't hate my atheist, yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got another David, this time in Babylon. How are you doing? Good evening, gentlemen. I want to thank you for uh, letting me come and talk to you. All right. Thanks for calling. I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, on January 27th, 2010, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, visited Auschwitz, the German death camp in Poland. He read from Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, the question is this. Why did he read from that chapter? And is there any connection between the Bible and the rebirth of Israel? in 1948. Now, before you guys answer, I just want to give a little background. I'm a premillennial dispensational eschatologist. I'm 57 years old. I've been studying the ancient Hebrew prophets for over 30 years. And my search started when I saw a movie called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Sure. I got a copy of the book, uh, did the research. Then I did something simple. I started following the news. Now, something interesting happened. My brother and I were very, very excited about this situation, because when we started following the news, we started seeing things happen. So what we did is, believe it or not, we wrote a little newspaper. Um, April will be 33 years ago that we wrote it. It's called The Last Trumpet. We just recently reprinted it in 2008 with the economic problems. And through the years, I've been saving a little scrapbook. And I lecture on the subject, and during the lectures, I show people the scrapbook. On the left-hand side, I show them the original article from 1980, and on the right side, I show them an article that came out just recently that says the exact same thing on the exact same subject in the exact same words. Now, when people see the scrapbook, they ask a simple question. Dave, how did you and your brother write this? Now, I'm going to give you an example, just very simple. The lead story in our last trumpet is France under a terrorist threat, Japan about to devalue the yen, London banks in trouble with a DV, like a, a rating of them. Then we have uh, a massive drought in the Midwest, and et cetera, et cetera. Gold soaring to an all-time high. Now, what happens is I, we have this comparison book we show people. Like I said, our article on the left-hand side, the other article that came out later on the right-hand side, and people cannot figure out how we wrote it. 
So what I'd like to do, you know, if you guys have an address, I'd like to mail you a complimentary copy. But what's interesting, I can't change the fact that I did my research for the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, in... Speed it up. In 19... Hold on a second. In 1980. And then I started following the news. And what they said was going to happen, I see it every day on the news. Now, I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and watch BBC News. So if you gave me a quiz on macroeconomics, Italian bond deals, what's going on with the Strait of Hormoz, I would do really well. And every day I see articles that I knew was going to happen. So that's all. So I'd like to ask you that question about Benjamin Netanyahu, because God did make an eternal promise to the Jewish people that he would give them the land of Israel. Then there's a specific prophecy in Deuteronomy 28 that they'd be scattered to the four corners of the earth, and they'd have trouble all through history, and then God would bring them back to their own land. And to top it off, after he would bring them back in their own land, the entire world would gang up on Israel and try to divide Jerusalem, which, if you notice, is on television. Okay, let's move on. Thanks for calling. Yeah, thank you for your commercial. Okay. Did when you did you, when did you make your first billion dollars in the stock market? Uh, well, did, no, did no. you guys want to answer the question? No, did, I'm sorry. Did, why, why, I don't know why he would want to read that. He might read it because he's convinced that it's a that there's a prophecy that's been interpreted, that, is, that has come to pass, as I'm sure you are. Um, but I don't care because that's not evidence. The fact that somebody is convinced that a particular interpretation has, has come to pass doesn't tell me anything. How, you know, it doesn't, even, even if it was, let's say it was, let's say it was true that there was something written in a book ages and ages ago that actually came to pass. At most, you've demonstrated and a, a remarkable phenomenon for which we do not have an explanation. You cannot assert that the cause for this is that there's a God who's per, that is relaying true information. Yeah, gentlemen, I'm sorry. Um, hello? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I understand. But what's interesting, um, like I said, I started out with just the question. And keep in mind, I appreciate you guys talking to me about this because I'm very, very uh, concerned about where the world is headed. And I see these predictions happening, and all I can tell you, the other interesting thing, too, is this. I forgot to mention this, that there's a new monetary system coming where they're going to be doing away with paper currency and going to barcodes and chips. Good grief. Good. Good. Do you not know, do you not know that people have been interpreting stuff in the Bible to, uh, as, uh, as predictions of things that were happening in their times for thousands of years? Right. The same right. things you're interpreting from the Bible to have significance now were interpreted by people 2,000, or, well, 1,000 years ago to have significance then. I, I you just, are no more right now than they were then. I, you, I, are, you are playing Nostradamus sorry. with the Bible I, I'm, and making money on it, which is what pisses me off. Oh, we don't and I, I think we've had, can we that please get rid of this jack-off who is no, advertising no, his no, book on the no, show? No, no, he, he just said he's not making money. We can't just assume he's making money. That's unfair. My okay. thing is, you, you say that they're going to be getting rid of paper money. Okay, so what? Why, is that a bad thing? Well, gentlemen, let me just give you just a 30-second overview. I, no, 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 no more 30-second overviews. I just asked a question. Is I'm that a sorry. bad thing? Oh, I understand. Well, when you read Revelation chapter 13, and he causes... All no, 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 David. Yeah, it's a bad thing. David, okay, it's a bad thing. Okay, why? why is it a bad thing? Well, let's put it this way. It's part of the prophetic scenario that... You've heard the term the Antichrist, guys. You guys are going to be very familiar with that. Whoa, 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 why, wait, why wait. Should, whoa. Why should we think any of that is true? Well, you don't have to. You don't have to think it's true. Okay, but bye. All right, Mark in Washington, thanks for waiting through that very painful, uh, not quite infomercial. Uh, people like that really piss me off. Ah. Yeah, hello. How you doing? Oh, uh, yes. But would you guys agree that... Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? I'd almost rather take your call than somebody else who has... Here's the uh. thing with prophecy. Um, first of all, it needs to be specific. It needs to be answerable by only a single circumstance. Otherwise, it's not prophecy. Otherwise, it's cherry-picking. It also needs to be in place and understood. It doesn't necessarily have to be publicly uh, known. 
Um, but if it is publicly known, it can't be something trivial that people are actually working on or working towards fulfilling. It can't be something that is obvious. When, you, when, when he called a minute ago, he was talking about France is under a terrorist threat and Japan is devaluing the yen and uh, London is blah, 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 blah. So what? Those things, I mean, that's the evening news and it has been for my entire life. You're picking out the ones that seem. You can put together, that's, 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 and I know why you're bugged at this and why it's so frustrating, <laughs> is this is straight up conspiracy theorist thinking. If you take disparate facts, you can weave them together to tell a story as long as you get to do all of the packaging. Somebody else can take those same facts or other facts to tell a completely different story. And so we're back to what we were talking about before, which was we have to have some agreed upon reliable standard of proof of determining what is real. You think you see prophecies. You're trying to Nostradamus the Bible, as, David, as Jeff was pointing out to, to David. Um, that's nifty. What does it get us? Why is it useful? What is it, how is it true? I mean, you're, you're building all this to say that there is a God. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. That there is a God and that you've been able to suss out God's secret plan. Cool. Back to Jeff's other good question at the beginning is, where's your billion dollars? You've been working on this since 1980 about all the world's financial markets and all this stuff. Right. And uh, How come you're not a bazillionaire? Yeah. That's, that's some really crappy financial advice you're getting there. But, hey. All right, we've got, is it Seller? Seller. Seller, how are you? Hey, how are you folks, uh, kids doing today? Kids. Yeah, you know, I usually, uh, I, well, I call kids like, you know, that naturally. Cool. Anyway, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, bold atheism, because I had, I had a tragedy in my life, uh, as I often do. I had this job what where someone you? was uh, trying to help me. Um, you know, because they had lost a loved one due to cigarette smoking, and they decided to pester me by putting signs every few feet inside this work area that I never smoked in. And uh, I got frustrated after she fired me for being a cigarette smoker um, because she was just trying to help. Um, so it, was, it wasn't until a few years later that I came up with the idea of making, like, a sign. I have one of a football coach and a priest bending over, you know, said, don't molest the children, you know, because that's something I think we could all agree upon. Right, because uh, you've completely lost me at this point. Hmm? You've completely lost me. You have a sign with a football yeah, coach. I made a, a sign. I made. I made an. Interesting what does this have to do with smoking? You're you're all over the place, oh, dude. Sorry, Make am, have am a point. What's place? your point? Um. So the the whole smoking thing, like you know, because she was just trying to annoy and pester me by putting signs all over the place. When clearly I couldn't smoke in the workplace anyway, I went outside and walked away from the building, but stayed in sight, you know, because... I, I'm lost always, again as to what the hell this has to do with atheism. Bold or? atheism, bold atheism, just a warning sign, you know, slap it on the side of your car, the front of your business, no molesting children, you know, is that... How bold? is that, what the hell's that got to do with bold atheism? I think that's bold, and that's, you know... It's got atheist. nothing to do with atheism. talk about that stuff. Look, look, um... You do realize that there are non-atheists who are opposed to raping children, right? Exactly. So right. So, so what the hell does this have to do with people, religious bold people atheism? And, and atheist people could agree on this one thing together, right? We could, we could work together and shout up in the air loud and proud, it's not right to molest kids. Yes, we can. Yeah, we agree. It's not right to molest kids. Of course. Thank you. I don't know what the hell that was. We, we do a weekly TV show, dude, which is all over the internet and stuff. I think we're being pretty freaking bold. Yeah. I, w I was uh, asked about the Pope. By all means, dude, if you want to make an overt display of your atheism, if that's what you feel like doing, go right ahead. Although I'm not sure I trust it's, you to do it. It's <laughs> but Just make sure that they're clear not, that you're representing yourself. We're not going to be able to afford a referee to watch him and True. review all of his behaviors. D if that's what you want to do, dude, go ahead. Yeah. And if other people don't like it, though, they will speak up, and that's the way things work. I'll give you Patrick's number, and you guys can <laughs> start lawsuits and stuff. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, it was unfair to Solaire, though, because we were kind of in a foul mood from that it previous was. guy. It was. Yeah. And, and so we apologize that your idea was dumb. But <laughs> All right. So. Just kidding. 
Um, we got Sean in Ogden. How are you? I'm good. How are you? We're uh, good. Hit or miss, evidently. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, so I've been uh, watching things on YouTube um, of you guys, and uh, I've seen several times when you've done, like, things on near-death experiences, right? Mm-hmm. And um, mine's rather different, so I uh, thought I would share it. Um, and, uh, like, two years ago, I had a stroke. And I had a really, I had a really scary near death experience. And some people don't think it actually was near death because, uh, oh, it's supposed to be white and fluffy and grandma. You know, I need to meet grandma or something. But uh, if that makes sense. But um, yeah, after because I, I was raised Mormon, so and I was still Mormon when I had that my uh, stroke. So um, after uh, I was trying to, you know, trying to decipher what it meant, right? Like, uh, oh, was I, you know, w was that hell or, you know, things like that. Um, but it, that didn't make sense to me. Like, I, I've never liked um, having to decipher dreams. I didn't, I've never, like, believed in that crap. Um, even, you know, when when I was a theist, but um, sorry about my speech. I had to relearn to talk also, but... No, you're fine. Uh, but, um, so I, I was trying to decipher what it meant, but the, at the same time I had, um, you know, theists telling me, oh, everything happens to, for a reason. And I was like, oh, well, God didn't do this to me. That doesn't make sense because, you know, uh, Paris Hilton has so much money and I have a stroke. Um, so, but um, what, I've know, what I've realized that is I've always been a deist, um, even, even when I was uh, Mormon. You know, I was like um, more of a hands-off God. But um, so I, once I've learned more about how the brain actually works, you know, and knowing that I had a lot of drugs in my uh, system and all that, I decided, you know, it makes a lot more sense that what I experienced was just a uh, dressed brain instead of, you know, some revelation from God and um, Yeah, because wouldn't that be a crappy way? I yeah. mean, wouldn't that be a crappy way for God to teach somebody something is to, I tell you what, let's, let's get you when you're at your absolute weakest, when your brain is on drugs and deprived of oxygen, when all sorts of things are going wrong in your body. Um, and this is when we're going to give you the best possible evidence when it is least reliable. I mean, it's, it's just silly. I mean, the, the idea that people think that, that a, a god would do that and, and could still look at that god as intelligent or caring uh, is kind of bizarre. I mean, that's, that's yeah. a prankster. Yeah, it, and I, I, I couldn't understand that. And um, all the people telling me everything happens for a reason, you know, made me realize that, no, not, it, nothing does. We create our own reasons. So um, I actually started thinking more, like, uh, skeptically, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I was really big into, like, other things, like um, conspiracy theories and things like that. So I started looking at that. So I've, um, but I, I'm like, okay, that's stupid. And so uh, that actually led, led me to atheism. And um, I just wanted to uh, share that. Cool. Uh, well, if you, see, if you have an experience like that, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to look at it like that. You can actually think about what ha actually happened instead of, you know, what could have happened. And, and we're glad you survived that. And it sounds like you're, you're doing much better. So. Oh, thank you. Thanks for calling, Sean. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Take yeah, care. Kinda, that kind of reminds me, you know, I was kind of half joking. But, uh -huh. you know, did you have, you have siblings? Yes. Did you ever ride in, like, in the backseat of the car with All your, the time. Yes. I have two older brothers. Were you the dick or were they the dicks? What do you mean? Like, you know, the, 
he's poking me, he's touching me thing? Uh, we, no, no, we were well behaved. Okay. So we didn't I, have that. I, I can imagine kids doing that. And, and this God who gives people near-death experiences and stuff like that uh -huh. reminds me of the little kid who's sitting there doing it until his parents are looking and then stops. <laughs> I'm not doing nothing, I promise. And that's what it reminds me of. Right. Or the same thing, the same reason that, you know, all the alien abductions are occurring. In no, Mom, I rural promise areas. I didn't give him proof of my existence. That would, that would take away his free will. Yeah. So I, I definitely didn't do that. Al in Chicago, thanks for waiting. Uh, hi, uh, I've been watching clips of this show for a long time, and you guys have really helped give a voice to atheists like myself who have. Uh, had some trouble uh, thinking about what, how to get in relationships and stuff. Well, thank you. Um, my question is, uh, I've been an atheist for about four years or so, and I just got involved with a girlfriend who believes in Christ and God the Father and so forth, but she's a pretty a la carte Christian. She's not really happy with the more traditional ideas, and she's had her share of why hath God forsaken me moments and that kind of thing. And I'm curious, like, what resources I should look for, anecdotes you might have. I know this isn't a relationship chat line or anything, but, like, what experience would you have with such a relationship of atheist with a believer? I have, I have no experience of that kind. You see, the, the thing is, is that every one of these is different, and I don't know what you guys have and haven't talked about or what the nature of your relationship is or what you're comfortable with, because I do know people um, who are in relationships where one person believes and the other one doesn't, and sometimes it works and sometimes it fails disastrously. Um, mm -hmm. it's, I think it is probably bad if either of you are intent on changing the other. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just say that it's probably not the best way to go into a relationship. Um, but talking honestly about what you, each of you believe or don't believe and why um, is something that I, I think would be important. Um, so it's not, I mean, you know, I could list resources, you know, Guy, Guy P. Harrison's book, 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in God, things like that. But that's all about trying to change her or trying to, you know, at least enlighten her as to, as to why you don't believe. Um, True. Go ahead. Is, is your lack of belief a problem for her? It isn't. Uh, she, the, the most that she's ever said is, um, you know, in those final moments, if I pass away before her, it'll be more of a, I'll miss you kind of thing. It's more like she believes that she'll probably go to heaven, but she doesn't know what happens to me. And that's the only thing that rubs me the wrong way about it. Um, well, you could let her know that she's not going to heaven either. Yeah, no. <laughs> Because nobody is. Exactly. Even if exactly. it's true, nobody is. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, the, if the Christian, the standard Christian model of heaven is accurate, um, then, and my mom is convinced that she's going, and she's also convinced that I'm going to hell, then I have to let my mom know that she's not going to heaven. Because my mom is this collection of memories and ideas and feelings and emotions, and she loves me, and it would be painful and bring her lots of sorrow to find out that I'm in hell. And so since there's no pain or sorrow in heaven, either she doesn't get to go, or she has been modified in some way so that to reconcile this conflict, in which case she's no longer my mom. So either way, my mom's not going to end up in heaven. Wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> um... I, I, I don't know if it's brilliant. Like, it's kind of easy to poke fun at things that are kind of silly, but... Well, yeah, that's true. Um, one small thing. I know you have a lot, but um, I, I do admit that I, I, I do have this back in my head desire for her to eventually take that road that I took. I was a black Muslim, and then I was a pan-deist, and then a sort of a deist, and then I just gave up on all that and just was happy to be an atheist. Um, do you notice that uh, people just simply have that predisposition to be questioning and l get to that point? Or uh, do you find that, I know this is a convoluted question, but do you find that people can just have certain experiences and watch each experience and end up having that kind of aha moment? I don't know that there is a moment. Uh, there is for some people. There's not for others. There's as many paths out of religious belief as there, there are in, uh, and, and maybe more. Um, you know, I, I can't fault you for wanting somebody that you care about uh, to rely on reason and to have beliefs that are consistent with reality. Um, but, 
it's the only the only caution that, that I'd say is that uh, continuing in a relationship where you are uh, strongly wanting to change the other person mm -hmm. from everything I understand uh, probably not a good thing but gotcha. I do I do know that it can work out and I hope it works out in your case and I know that what I well, I don't know I think that the key is to talk with each other as openly and honestly as possible honest till it hurts because if you guys make it through honest till it hurts everything after that's cake coolness I appreciate the I appreciate your time and I'll be watching you for quite a while yeah and if your relationship falls apart you cannot sue me <laughs> Will do. thanks Al thanks so much guys as a reminder after the show's over here in about 20 minutes, uh, we'll be going to Threadgills to eat. It's right there on the screen. Don't know what you're doing. It's up to you. The, the rules are silly. Joss in Round Rock, Texas. Hey, you're close to home. Yes, I am. Um, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you guys. Thanks for calling. Um, I uh, am recently become an atheist. Recently came to that conclusion. Uh -huh. And one of the hardest things for me to come to terms with, which I have, but I'm curious about, was the idea that there's no afterlife, which there isn't, but it's such an appealing idea. <laughs> it's hard to wrap your head around it when you grow up with it. Um, I was wondering if any other atheists struggled with that idea, if you guys struggled with it, putting it aside. Uh, I, I didn't struggle with it. Um, though I did become a transhumanist. I don't know if you know what that is. I'm um, actually not familiar with that term. That's, uh, uh, well, one of the, uh, humanism is, um, you know, a worldview that, that says we should take into account the human condition and base our behaviors on, you know, what suits our lives as humans. And transhumanists say that's not good enough. We should also be like, uh, using technology to improve our condition even to the point where we're not necessarily what you'd call human anymore and one of the things that that encompasses is radical life extension because um, mm -hmm. I'm not looking forward to being dead not that no. I'll have any experience of being dead once it happens right but um, uh, I'd, I'd like to hang around as long as possible and um, uh, so so it, it's possible I was driven to that by uh, by something like uh, dissatisfaction with the non-existence of a heaven but really the reason I want to stay alive is because you know there's cool new movies coming out all the time and there's projects to do and things right I wanna I wanna have cool experiences and I've never heard that you know like the new Star Wars trilogy that Disney announced is gonna be available in heaven <laughs> never heard that right I don't know that there's going to be a market for my next uh, role-playing game that I design in heaven or the next art that I do in heaven. I don't know that any of the things that I enjoy being alive for would be part of that in the first place. To me, it sounds like a lot of sitting around and, and uh, worshiping God all, uh, and praising God all the time, which has never been a lot of fun for me. So no. <laughs> maybe it'd be more I think the, help. the thing to do is, you know, make the most out of the time you've got and, uh, you know, be uh, smart about um, how you live your life so you get as much of that time as possible. And, mm -hmm. and I'd say that I didn't really struggle with this a whole lot either, but I, I do know a lot of people who do. Um, to me, it was kind of like, I've, I've said before, it was, it was like discovering that I had been lied to. And so how do you deal with that afterwards? Is this, if, if somebody had told you that when you're, you know, how old are you now? Oh, I'm 26. If somebody had told you when you're 26 you were going to inherit a billion dollar trust fund and you hit 26 and discovered that it wasn't there, you'd probably be mad and maybe uh, a little sad and hopefully you hadn't made a bunch of decisions earlier in your life that put you tragically in debt for the billion dollars that you're, you were expecting and didn't get. But once you make it through there, you have to acknowledge that you didn't lose anything that was real. What you lost was this illusion. What you lost was this kind of false promise. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of helps um, a little bit, but to me it was empowering. Because mm -hmm. the the Christian the standard Christian notion uh, of heaven is this. First of all, I had already decided that heaven was hell, uh, if it was anything. But it, it's 
it cheapens everything about life. It makes every second that you spend, you know, all, all of your entire 26 years and my nearly 44, uh, it's nothing. Yeah. And yet, these are all the things that matter to us. That means that every moment that I've spent watching a cool movie <coughs> or making love to my wife or eating a good meal or engaging with friends, all of this is trivialized and meaningless and is really just a place to wipe your feet before you get to the real world. What kind of cosmic practical joke is that? And so yeah. it was really empowering to figure out that, you know what, all the available evidence points to the conclusion that so far as we can tell, this is the only life I'm going to get. So it's better that I actually make the most of it. And while some people will look at that and say, oh, well, you're just interested in, you know, self-pleasure, this hedonistic lifestyle. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't advocate hedonism in, in a harmful way, but yeah, damn it, you should enjoy stuff. Why would you not? Why would you deprive yourself, if, if you're not hurting anybody else, of something that brings you pleasure before you kick the bucket? Yeah. Well, I found um, coming to atheism quite liberating and um, made a lot of things that hadn't made sense before make a lot of sense. So it was a process. <laughs> well, welcome to reality. Yeah. I like it here. <laughs> yes. The water's fine. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank thank thanks, you very much. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Right. All right. Did you? I didn't know if you had anything to add. I just clicked off. Um, well, I'm just gonna, gonna remind folks that you know heaven and hell are the carrot and stick of religion, right? Yeah. That you you get beat over the head head with the hell stick, and lured on with the uh, with the carrot, um, to uh, to to get you to fall in line and 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 buy the story of the religion and. And kowtow to the god, and and uh, and you know give lip service to all the uh, the attendant beliefs, um, but carrots and sticks have nothing to do with reality. They have nothing to do with you know actually having a good experience. They're they're tools of manipulation, and um, so finding out that the carrot they've been dangling in front of you not only isn't the best carrot in the universe, but is actually you know made of plastic yes right it's a it's a plastic fruit ball carrot uh it is a means of just no longer following along that path of striking out on your own and doing what you want to do with your life it reminds me a lot of the people who will call in to say but yeah but but what if aren't you worried about you know concerned about a hell and etc I, I you know every time i hear that i want to ask how, how much time have you spent worried about all the other heavens and all the other hells from all the other religions you didn't choose to accept? I'm, you haven't spent any time worrying about those. Why are you worried about this one? I am personally um, really broken up about the fact that I'm not going to probably develop a, a heart ailment that requires me to put a little atomic thing in my chest and wear a suit of powered armor and become a superhero. That's, that, that pisses me off that that's probably not going to happen to me. That would be... That would, would be great, be, you, be awesome. but you don't, you don't go around worrying about crap like that, about fantasies that are not going to be true. Yeah, it's, it's not much makes of a, a good, threat. Makes a good comic book and movie, though. Yeah. All right, Jenna in Iron Atlanta, Man. how are you? Iron Man reference. Hi, how are y'all doing? Pretty good. Um, long time watcher, first time caller, blah, blah, blah. Um, I was curious about your opinion for the near political future. I'm about to come out of college with uh, my bachelor's degree, and I'm curious to know whether or not you think it would be possible in the next 30 or so years for an atheist to be elected to a political office, a high-ranking political office. How high? Right. You want to be president? Oh, hell no, but maybe Congress. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's already. Wait a minute. Is there some? Is it the, the yeah, guy in the House or the Senate? Who's uh, Pete well, Stark? Pete, Pete Stark one, didn't get reelected. Do you think that there oh, will be more than say yeah. five or six atheists within Congress? You know. Oh, I, I guarantee you, there already are. It's whether or not they're actually out. Um, well, that's that's the, what I mean. Do you think the political, you know, sphere we've got right now would allow for yeah. outed atheists to be elected? Yeah. Since we've already had. 
uh, outed atheists elected. Pete Stark did get reelected, although he didn't get reelected this last time. But there's no there's no reason to think that had anything to do with uh, his religious beliefs. So we've already seen it happen. And uh, there was a poll that came out last year that for the first time, more than 50 percent of people polled would actually vote for a qualified atheist for president. So mm -hmm. we're seeing things change, and the not religiously affiliated um, are increasing much more rapidly than the religiously affiliated. Um, and, uh, you know, I've said before, unfortunately, you know, we've kind of got to wait for a generation to die off, or maybe two, or maybe ten, um, before we see massive changes. But we're seeing good changes. And I think that you could probably, if you started now, running for a local uh, office of some type to, to you know, gain the, the requisite experience. Um, I think there's no reason I, I couldn't see you as an out atheist in the House or the Senate or even in the White House if you wanted. Well, I don't think I'd take on that stress, but <laughs> thanks for your and, time. And, 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 one, and one more thing, on the flip side, mm -hmm. um, you know, deciding now that you don't think that uh, atheis atheism is going to be a viable option for a successful political candidate in future, and therefore choosing to hide your atheism uh, so that you can be successful in politics, that move will not contribute to a world where atheists can be successful in politics. Yeah. yeah. You have that choice, right? You can, you can do, do what you need to do to get what you, what you want in life. Um, you know, I don't, uh, uh, it, it, you know, you have to make the choices that are smart for you. But if you care about helping the world become that kind of place where it's safe for atheists, um, then being out and open about it is the, is the thing to do. Well, of course. I mean, if I did end up trying to go for a political office, I would do it as an outed atheist. But the reason I brought up the question is because I saw a study that was done a little while ago that said that atheists were the most distrusted group, especially yep. here in the United States. So yep. I'm curious to see if you thought that might change. We, we, recently, we recently rated higher than, uh, than uh, Christian fundamentalists. Is that oh, right? Awesome. There was the, there have been a series of these things. Uh, I might be getting that wrong. It might be right wing conservatives. Yeah, the study but it's that, one of those groups. The study that you're talking we, about. We scored like number two, right above them. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, study, the study that Jen is talking about. Um, we cited several times. It's a few years old. It's probably fairly accurate in certain demographics. The one that said that more than fifty percent would vote for a qualified atheist for president. Um, that one is relatively new. Um, and makes me cautiously optimistic. But the other thing is that, you know, doing it as an out atheist, um, while I, I'm, don't be wrong, I'm not discouraging anybody from, uh, be out, yay, do stuff is out. But there's no religious test for any public office or trust guaranteed by the Constitution. So they're not technically supposed to even ask you about religion. And so what it is is just be honest, and if it comes up, it comes up, which it will. But if it doesn't, which is the world I'd like to see, the world where people running for office, we don't, you know, ask them, uh, d you know, whether or not they believe in this God thing. Instead, we ask them about what their positions are on reality. And you, know, you can weed out kind of the, the supernatural crowd, the people who don't use reason and evidence to make decisions without asking them the question about a God. Um, you know, at least yeah. at, at least not as a, as a test. Now, that, don't get me wrong, I think it's perfectly valid to look at somebody uh, and judge whatever it is they happen to say about their beliefs to determine whether or not they're qualified for office. Every individual, as an individual, you can say, uh, no, I'm not going to vote for, you know, a theist or this type of theist or any of those things. Yeah. You can do whatever you want there. Yeah, well, that, that would be the ideal is if that weren't a necessary requirement right now, sociologically speaking, but... Anyway, thank you for your time, and y'all have a nice day. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Jenna. Good luck. I'll vote for you. If I lived in Georgia. Yeah. Aaron in Philadelphia, how are you? Hi, guys. How's it going today? Good. So uh, my question comes down to, this is something that's been bugging me for a couple weeks. I actually heard, first really got thinking about it from a, of all things, a This American Life episode. They were talking about a preacher who'd basically been kicked out of his religion because he didn't believe in hell. And this is what, I mean, I'm, personally, I'm, I'm an atheist, and this is one of the big things that drove me away, is all the religions that I've ever encountered basically say, 
you're screwed up for being human. You deserve some sort of eternal punishment, whether it's, you know, reincarnation forever because you can't get it right or hell or what have you. I was wondering if you guys know, where does that come from? Why do people need to believe that either, well, definitely other people, and then sometimes even themselves, that they deserve to this, have this kind of eternal punishment just because they were born human? Um. I don't, know, I, I don't know that I can say with any authority where it comes from. I suspect that it comes from an innate sense of justice that has been perverted. And so one of the things that the Christians have, have, have kind of lobbed at me in discussions about morality um, is this idea that, well, under my view of morality, there's no possibility of uh, guaranteed universal justice. Um, that it might be possible for somebody to do something and get away with it. Uh, and that's true. Right. Some people are going to do stuff and get away with it. And, and they, they find this just outright offensive. The reason I call it a perverted sense of justice is that they, they, they say this and then they point to Christianity as this solution for ultimate justice. When what they're pointing to is not ultimate justice because somebody could do something and completely get away with it because their religious model of morality has a loophole of forgiveness in there. There's no, it's not based on what you did and what you deserved. There are, you, could, you could slaughter an entire nation of people and if you sincerely repent and forgive and are touched by the Holy Spirit and God decides to grant you grace, you get a loophole. That's not justice. And I feel if, you know, they don't get to pretend to have a moral high ground or a high ground with regard to justice. I can understand the appeal of it. Um, and also people do things that they, they get away with themselves and that incurs some guilt. They recognize that, oh, I'm to blame and I'm not perfect. And so religion kind of, in Christianity in particular, uh, plays on those things and amplifies them um, to the point where you just, you accept something that it should be obviously immoral and absurd as if it were moral and just. So even to the point where somebody says, well, you know, this just doesn't make sense to me. I don't see how this squares with loving God. And they throw him out for saying well, that hell can't exist rather than thinking, hey, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe this doesn't square with our view of a loving God. So, I mean, yeah. it really gets, it just gets that deep into people's heads. Evidently. Yeah, fair enough. All right, well, that was about it. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your time. All right, thanks. Take, take care. Did you, you didn't have anything to add on nope. the hell? No, you covered it. Okay. Uh... Let's see. Gabriel in Portland. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just I was calling because I'm getting ready to go into the military, and I've been uh, a Christian for about you know 25 years. I'm 25 years old, and as of recently, I've kind of discovered your show, and I've really started questioning what I really believe in. And I've always been a big fan of science, and I've kind of come to the terms that atheism is probably more correct than the alternative. And Matt, I know that you have uh, some experience in the, in the military, and I was just wondering what kind of advice you would have for a person who really doesn't, you know, I'm getting ready to go to basic, and I've heard that you, know, you can either go to church or you can clean the barracks, and I was, hey, I Gabe, know that there's... Uh, Gabriel, we are out of time. They're putting the credits up. The best advice I can give you, look for the Military Association of Free Thinkers. Look for the uh, of Atheists and Free Thinkers. Um, and also you can email tv at atheist-community.org, and we'll see if we can direct you to somebody else. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everybody, who's in the studio audience today, and Jeff. And there's the people who made the show happen, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye, folks.